have already mentioned that, and that's the problem with me being an Oklahoma Sooners fan. Hey, I just I grew up most of my life out there. But I, I did spend five years in Tennessee when I was, um, let's see, I guess not long after birth. My uh, mom and dad moved us up there to Carroll County, Tennessee. And um, there are a couple of things that I remember about Carroll County, Tennessee, and the Clarksburg congregation. Still just love that church to death. Uh, when I was back at Freed Hardeman years later, I began working some with that church, which my dad had worked with, you know, 18 or 20 years earlier. So it's kind of neat how things like that can happen. But I remember, you know, two things that stick out in my mind about that congregation and about my time there as just a little kid. Uh, one of them was how much I loved the song, Victory in Jesus. I mean, just uh, love that song, still love singing it, appreciate the way that you introduced that song for us tonight and led us in that. Also remember that one of our, our elders, his name was Lois Ray, Lois Ray Pritchard, just a great godly man, a good, uh, good father, good husband, well respected in the, uh, in the community. And his wife, she was, uh, she was a doll. She was a big, lovable, huggable, just wonderful Christian woman. Her name was Victorine. And uh, I remember as a kid, you know, before you can read, you just sing based upon what you hear, and I would belt out the entire time we were there. I thought it was, oh, Victorine in Jesus. I mean, I would just sing it. I mean, and I loved how you all were singing that song just then. I mean, I, I could, uh, it just seemed like we were putting our effort in that worship to God as we talked about the victory in Jesus. Isn't it fun to win I mean, I don't know many people who just enjoy losing. Uh, it seems like in sports, if you play sports or if you root for a sports team, you know, I'm, I'm 42 years old and I'm kind of like ready to quit, out, quit on sports because I feel like my teams, they, they've lost so many times. Uh, you know, my wife, she's an Alabama fan. They win all the time. I guess I just kind of have jumped on that bandwagon because they win so much. But um, isn't winning fun? Hey, anybody want to say that losing... Losing is just a lot of fun. No, I mean, people don't really talk about that. I, I mean, winning can just kind of get you in the dumps. I think the only time I ever, I ever played in a state tournament in the finals when I was about 16 years old, and uh, we had lost the first round, and uh, we made it back to uh, the finals, but we had to beat the team twice. And I thought, okay, this, this could happen. This might happen. And I made the last out of the state tournament. I popped up to the catcher, and the game was over, and we lost. And that just, that, you know, it felt terrible. But, you know, it feels really good to win. Um, I got to see my 17-year-old son win a soccer state tournament this last November, and it was, it was exciting to see that. That's always, it's always fun. Um, you know, those Alabama fans, I don't know if I can talk much about them here, but, I mean, just imagine what they went through when their quarterback got sacked in overtime against Georgia, and, you know, their coach, what's his name? Uh, is it Nick Saban? Is that his name? And he's going crazy because his quarterback took a sack, and now it's going to be second down and, you know, 99 yards or something, and it's overtime, and there's no way, and then, bam, the quarterback throws a 41-yard pass, and they win. I mean, just imagine what those fans were going through. I think I've met one Alabama fan here so far this week. You can imagine it if you know football. Victory. You know, as, as fun as it is to win a game, maybe it's winning a card game, maybe it's winning a sports game, maybe it's winning something else. Hopefully it's not the lottery, okay? Don't, we don't need that, all right? It's just a waste of money. Uh, you know, don't you know all those people who win the lotteries, don't half of them or most of them always have problems anyway? <laughs> I mean, later on, you know, they become uh, so rich and they have this love of money apparently and just messes up their lives. Winning generally is a lot of fun. But none of that can compare. As fun as it might be, as nice as it might be for you to celebrate a national championship, Whatever sport you like, whatever game you like, maybe it's a national archery championship. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Rodney kills the biggest deer he's ever seen, and, and that bullet didn't go in one ear and out the other, okay? And maybe he's just rejoicing about that victory, if you will. But it just doesn't compare. Nothing can compare with a victory in Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that right? 
And yet, so often, you know, it seems like Christians, we're not quite as, as joyful as maybe we, we should be. And I realize, Christians, we don't have to walk around with this fake, phony smile on our face all the time. I, I get that. I mean, we have down-in-the-dumps kind of days, and, and we have better days. But generally speaking, our everyday life should be, I am a Christian. I have the victory through Jesus Christ. Satan no longer has a hold on me. At one time, he did. And we were going to suffer the eternal consequences of our sins. Rightly so. You know, some, some might have this idea that, that, Eric, why did I, I mean, would I really have to? I mean, couldn't God just accept me even if I didn't become a follower of Christ? No, and here's, here's why. God could not do that. First of all, we, we understand all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has gone astray. And everyone deserves to be punished. And here's why. Because our God is a holy God. He's absolutely, perfectly, 100% pure and holy. So holy that there is not one speck of spiritual decay in Him. No sin in Him. And He cannot. He is of purer eyes, the prophet Habakkuk says in, one, in, in chapter 1. He is of purer eyes than to behold evil. He can't fellowship it. He can't associate in that spiritual sense with it. Isaiah chapter 59, 1 and 2, sin separates us from God. He cannot look upon that, cannot fellowship that. It's against His holy nature. Furthermore, it is in accordance with His all-just and fair nature that sin must be punished. You know, it is, it is just and it is fair for wickedness to be punished. We all know that. Do you think very highly of parents who allow their kids to do whatever they want to do, say whatever they want to say, act however they want to act, and never receive correction and punishment for that? We know what we would... Those kind of parents, we would say, they need, they need to, to change. Judges in this county, in this state, in this country, we want judges... What do we want judges, judges to do and juries to do when they hear a case where a man who has no doubt murdered ten people. Do we want the judge to say, oh, well, that's okay, you know, you had a bad day, I think we'll let you... No, we want those judges to be just and to be fair for a variety of reasons. Number one, I mean, we understand how logical and reasonable and appropriate it is to, uh, for someone who has done that kind of crime to receive punishment. Furthermore, it is, a, it is a deterrent to others to keep them from acting that way. At least, in, that, that's the hope. Our God is 100% pure. He's 100% holy and just. But thankfully, thankfully, He's also 100% loving. So loving that He was willing to give us the victory when we were absolutely going to lose. There's no doubt about it. We were going to lose. There's no hope. Ephesians chapter 2, there's no, there's no hope without Christ, right? He is the way. How, how is it that He is the way? How could He be the way home? I mean, you know, scripturally speaking, reasonably, logically speaking, what is it that makes Jesus the way other than the fact that He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. Well, because Jesus, He satisfies the holiness and the justice of our God. You see, God lovingly sent His Son John chapter 3, verse 16, to the world to save us. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And when Jesus came to earth for right out about 33 years, He never had a wicked thought. He never said a wicked word. He never performed, did a wicked thing. He was pure. He was holy. And He became the pure and holy and perfect sacrificial lamb who was slain in our place. First Peter chapter 2, 
He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in, in, in his mouth. Verse 24, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The, the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 10, he offered himself without spot to God. Chapter 10, verse 28, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. We have the victory in Jesus Christ over death. We all were lost. And I'm telling you, being lost, you know, being lost physically, that, is, uh, that, that can be unnerving, right? Just next time you see Kyle Butt, ask him to tell you about him being really, truly lost out at sea. The first time he told me that true story, I think I might have cried, Rodney, out of concern for my brother. I can't believe what he went through. I won't tell you the story. Maybe he can tell you some other time. But it just had me just about in tears. Being lost on land or in the sea, that can be... But being lost spiritually... Listen, folks, we can have some bad days. We can, uh, we can lose our house. We can lose our health. We could lose family. It does not compare to being lost spiritually and suffering the eternal consequences of that sin. Because our God is a perfectly holy God and He is a perfectly just God. And the only way that we have hope of eternal life is through Jesus Christ. I mean, think for just a moment about, uh, about death in the eyes of the unbeliever. Think about the unbeliever's death. I mean, think about the atheist. The atheist, he thinks that this life is all there ever, that, that it's all there is. I mean, that's, kind of, that's, a, that's a bummer. I mean, you know, there's some people who pass away early on in life. There are others who, like me, I just don't want this life to be all there is however long I live. I want to see those who have preceded me in death, who've been faithful to the Lord. I, I, I want to believe that if things proceed naturally as they normally do, and my parents, my Christian parents precede me in death, I want to see them again. The atheist says, oh, there's nothing after death. That's a bummer, you know, that's just, that's not a nice way to live. Of course, I'm not saying I want to believe this, and that's why I do. I'm saying, hey, I, I know this is the case. I believe it with all my heart based upon the evidence. We talked about some of that already this week. But then the atheist, wait a minute, then he, he, uh, he dies and he awakens in the afterlife and he realizes, uh-oh, I was wrong. There is another life. But I don't have it. I don't have that eternal life. He discovers there's another life and I wasn't ready for it. But then think about the, think about death for the Christian. Think about death and what it, what that means for the follower of Christ. Well, this is not all there is. Folks, this is, I, I don't know how you measure it, but the life that we're living right now, it's just so, so small compared to everlasting life that will continue and continue on and on and on. Now, brothers and sisters and friends, if you're here tonight and not a Christian, I would encourage you to consider your life in view of eternity. Ask yourself, am I lost? Am I saved? Jesus came to earth to save me. We can have what the thief on the cross had. I mean, think about it. The thief on the cross was dying on the cross. He was suffering the consequences of his own sins, physically, that is, dying on the cross, um, sentenced to death that way because of being a thief. But he was penitent. Now, he was still living under the old law. And Jesus, we've already talked about, he has the power, had the power to forgive sins. And he told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And that thief awakened in paradise only a few minutes or hours later. Now, that's an awesome thought, isn't it? Isn't that awesome? We've talked about, you know, I forget that I've got some verses up here. We've, uh, we've talked about how, how going all the way back to the beginning... 
God helped show man, hey, there's one coming who's going to defeat death. Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. You will bruise his heel. And what we see as that has played out throughout history is, did Satan have a part in, in causing this sham of a trial to happen? In tempting people to betray Christ? In tempting people to... And, and, and wanting them to murder Him? Yes, was Jesus... Heal bruised in the sense that he died on the cross, but was Satan crushed and the victory won through, as we talked about last night, the resurrection of Jesus? Don't you love the chapter on the resurrection there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Don't you love the fact that Paul says that death is swallowed up in victory? I mean, death... Yes, in, in one sense, it's a bummer. I mean, I don't know anyone who, who just, you know, let me just walk out here and, and die. I mean, that kind of, you know, I, and I think God made us all with this innate sense of wanting to just, you know, continue to live. I mean, physically, we have this will to want to live. I think this, that seems natural to me from everything I understand and even just what I experience in my own body. But God has told us that, that that thing that throughout history has... I mean, since Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of the garden and away from the tree of life that they could eat of and continue to, to live, ever since then when they were separated from that and they began to decay and they began to die, mankind has been... Wait, death is the, the greatest foe of mankind? And God says, no, it ain't. It doesn't have to be. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, Paul said. And the strength of the sin is law. When the law is violated, I believe he means that is. But thanks be to God who what? Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? He's given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to go through a couple of these passages because you know sometimes I get so excited about preaching these lessons and some of the verses come into other lessons and, and we talk very briefly. Did we not last night about how Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, that is the Christian victory through Jesus Christ. Our death can mean gain. Now, but let me say this. And please hear what the Scripture says. That if we are not saying, for to me to live is Christ, then how can we say, to die is gain? But see, the victory has been given to us. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to say, to die is gain. We uh, talked about 2 Corinthians 5, 6-8 through 8 last night. I just want to read uh, verse, verse 8 for us where Paul said, We are confident. After he said, We walk by faith, not by sight. He said, We are confident. Yes, well pleased. Don't you love what Paul says here? Rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Really, Paul? We are confident. The victory is won. Yes, well pleased to be absent from the body. That's death. It's a separation. Our soul and our body, our spirit and our body, that's the separation. That's when death occurs. To be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We're confident. We're well pleased. Yes, the wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is what? It is eternal life. How? It's through Jesus Christ. Don't you love the book of Revelation? The theme of which is victory. It's overcoming. It's what we have in Christ Jesus and Jesus says in Revelation 2 and verse 11, He who overcomes, that is, he who gets that victory, shall not be hurt by the second death. We don't have to fear. We don't have to fear the first death. Paul said, we're confident, yes, well, pleased to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We don't have to fear the second death. You know what the second death is. That's the eternal separation from God. That is those who are going to be suffering eternal punishment. We don't have to fear that. Why? Because we've been given the victory in Jesus Christ. You know what else we don't have to fear? You know what else uh, we have been given the victory over is doubt. And doubt is just not, uh, that's not, 
Isn't it, you know, think about our young people here. Some of y'all going back to uh, high school, college. and You know what's never really fun is taking those tests. You know, even, I don't, you know, y'all might not have these dreams, but even in my 30s, I think I was still dreaming about showing up for class and not being prepared for a test. And I was doubting my ability to pass the test. That happened a few times, I think, in my schooling, but I, I think I learned from some of those mistakes. I hope so. You know, doubting is just, I don't know many people, no, they say now just, you know, losing is a lot of fun and victory is not that great, but most people don't say, I like to doubt. And doubt is really good for you. Now, maybe there are some aspects of life where, you know, health, there, there's some healthy doubt, but generally speaking, we like to be confident, right? Why, why are we doubting? You know what? What I rarely hear Christians say? I say rarely. I don't... Some, I'll just say sometimes and maybe too much. When we're talking about eternal life and going to heaven, you know what, what the way I oftentimes hear Christians talk about that? It's, it's are, are you going there? Are you ready for heaven? Are you ready for eternal life? Uh, well, I, are you going? I, I think so. I hope so. I'd like to go. And, and, and maybe that's because we're trying to be humble, or I, I, don't, I don't know. But, you know, Jesus did not leave the wonders of heaven to walk on this dirty old earth for 33 years and to suffer and die and suffer all sorts of torture and ultimately death on an old rugged cross so that we would walk around here on this earth as, as Christians with all sorts of doubt about our eternal destiny. I was in, uh, talking uh, several years ago, I, I, I was um, doing a survey in a congregation, asking all sorts of questions. It was an anonymous survey. I was trying to, to not be very threatening at all, okay? I just, hey, could you answer these questions, uh, fill it out, uh, give it back to me anonymously. I'm not looking for, you know, you individually. I just want to see what the answers to some of these questions are. And most of them were not very hard-hitting questions. You know, everything from, hey, do you read the bulletin article when it comes out? Do you? And just all sorts of other things. But the very last question was very, it was, it was kind of in-your-face hard-hitting. And it was simply, if you died today, do you believe you would go to be with Jesus eternally? Receive eternal life? in the realized full sense. And I, it was a congregation of probably about 200 people, and I gave it from the seventh grade all the way up to the oldest adult class. So, I don't know, maybe 120, 130 people there. And 9% responded and said, no, I would not. We're gathered together with the church on the first day of the week, and 9% said, I would not receive eternal life. 50% said they did not know. And 40% said they would go and be with Jesus. They would receive eternal life. They would be in paradise at that moment, they believed. Now, I don't know all the reasons why they responded the way they, they, they did. Here is what concerns me is that we as Christians, God wants us to be full of faith and conviction and have no doubt. Jesus did not die on the cross so that we would just live for decades here as Christians full of doubt. Why can't we be confident? Why can't we be sure about this? You know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you or set you free. It will set you free from sin and the consequences of it. Furthermore, John said, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know that you have eternal life. You know how we can know it? Just, just a, a few quick points and then we're going to move on. This lesson doesn't have many major points tonight, okay? It, can we know that God exists? We've talked about that already some this week, right? We can know it. We talked about matter demands a maker, life demands a life giver, design demands a... How can you have all of this stuff in the universe without maker, life giver, designer, intelligence, a moral law giver? We can know that God exists. Can we know the Bible is His Word? Yes, we can. We can see the evidence for that, the, the all-encompassing reason. 
I believe, is the fact that the Bible writers were correct about everything they wrote, whether about the past, the present, or the future. We can know that. Okay, so we can know that God exists, and we can know the Bible is His Word. And you know, the Bible instructs us. He, it gives us the way to eternal life. Listen, good brothers and sisters, let's not uh, de-emphasize. Let's make sure we understand the value, how awesome it is that, okay, we're not in heaven yet. We don't have eternal life in the realized, finished sense. But we know the way. Isn't it awesome to know the way? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of us have ever been out and about and just totally lost? Like, did not know where we were. Listen, I've been lost in a big building before and the lights went out and I could not see my hand in front of my face. And, I mean, I got scared because I, I was trying. I got more scared as time went on because I just could not figure out how. I didn't know which way was left, right, uh, hardly up and down. I was so lost in just a building. I was driving through the great state of Iowa for probably the first time in my life a year or two ago. And I had flown into a city, and then I was renting a car and driving uh, to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, probably five hours away. And, you know, from where I was, I, I can't remember what t city it was, Cedar Rapids or something. From there, it was probably about a five-hour trip. And, you know, we get kind of... Uh, Oh, you know, we get used to certain things pretty quickly. Like, I, I rarely look at maps anymore. Any of you like, well, we're going on a trip. We're going to get the old map out. We don't do that as much. Maybe some people do, but a lot of people, they just, what do they do? I said, just get that in here and put that in my phone and then hit go. And go. I mean, that's how I found the church building here. I'd never been here before. I'm glad I'm here. I tell you, I feel like, an, can I just be one of your adopted sons and come back some other time? Maybe if Rodney's ever out of town, he'll say, Eric, come drive four hours and come preach for me or something. Uh, anyway, so we, we use these map programs and GPSs, and I don't understand how it all works, but here, here's what I, I do know. I was driving through Iowa, and I realized it went from like four bars to three bars to two bars to one bar, and I thought, I'm in the middle of Iowa. I mean, cornfields for days, houses, I mean, miles apart it seemed like. I'm probably exaggerating just a little bit. I honestly had no idea where I was going. It was turn left here, turn right here. It was go through this small town and that small town, another small town. I'm driving, I'm going to be driving for five hours. It hit me. I wasn't lost yet, but I was scared because I thought I might get lost. But you know what? made me feel really good is the fact that it never quit working. I got from point A to point B five hours later or five and a half I pulled into my brother's driveway in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Whew. You know what? You know how I got there? Well, I had a car that got me there but it was like I had a map. And man, I was so thankful for that. You know, how would we know about eternal life, to receive eternal life, and know how to, to get eternal life? God who exists, the Bible that is His Word, He has revealed to us, it's through Jesus Christ. That is the way. And it's impossible without Him. You know, it's, you know in Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says that Jesus is the great high priest. And you remember the Old Testament high priest? You remember that, that he could go into the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest. And only the high priest how many times a year? How many days a year? Once. Into the Holy of Holies. You know, the, the writer of Hebrews says that, that Jesus has opened up, He's opened up for us the way into the Holy of Holies. It's through His blood. It's through His sacrifice. It's through His death that He's given us this victory. And we do not have to doubt it. It's as if Jesus... It's as if we were all, you know, hiking up a mountain and maybe we're doing a little more than hiking. We are um, we're climbing it. I've never really done mountain climbing. I've done some mountain hiking, but not mountain climbing. I'm a little scared of heights. Um... But you get to a certain point, and it's as if there is this vertical ledge, 
that has not been fastened and rigged and there's just, I mean, there's hundreds of, of feet, vertical edge, and there's no way you're getting up there to the top of the mountain, which is your, you know, destination. That's where you want to be. And it's as if Jesus sacrificed his safety and he made it, he fastened, he rigged it in such a way that all you have to do is follow his lead. Now, in rigging that for us, in, fast, in, in making that way, paving that way for us, he gave his life. He lost his life. He gave it. He died. It cost him his life. But it opened up the way into the Holy of Holies. And you might say, well, Eric, wait a minute. I, I just, I, we've gotten the victory, but listen, I, I'm just not perfect. How is it that, that I can do this? God calls us out of sin to walk in the light. But you know there's a difference in walking in the light. 1 John chapter 1, 6-10. I'm, I'm pointing in the back like y'all can see that. Now y'all looking up here. I love how you have that in the back. though. That really helps a preacher. Um, my, my children always tell me, Dad, you always distract yourself when you're preaching. And I'm sorry about that. I think I'm getting worse at that as I, as I get older. But you know the Apostle John, as he was writing there in 1 John chapter 1, he let us know that there's a difference in walking in the light and walking in, in darkness, we can know the difference. And it's not a, a perfected walking in the light, meaning it's not, I'm never going to mess up. Maybe sometimes that's why we think we're so unsure about our, our salvation through Jesus Christ because we think back to, well, I mean, I just totally blew it two days ago and I sinned against God. And I, I, I've, I've confessed that sin. I've prayed to God for forgiveness. I've repented of it. But, well, that's what God calls us to do. You know, there in 1 John, I just love this passage. I'm going to read this. And if you want to open up to 1 John chapter, chapter 1, verse 5, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, if you're walking in darkness, you don't have the victory. Or if you had it and you began walking in darkness, you've, well, you, you've let go of the victory. But notice what he goes on to say. But if we walk in the light... As He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's beautiful, isn't it? The blood of Jesus as we walk in the light cleanses us of all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Notice chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation. He's the what? He's that, as some translations say, that the, the, the atoning sacrifice. He took our place. He's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. You know, what does it mean to walk? You know, the Greek behind the walking and the light and walking in the darkness, it is to walk about in. It is to... And let me just illustrate it this way. Can you know... You, any, any baseball fans in here? I used to love the game of baseball. I hardly ever watch it these days. But I um, used to love the game of baseball. And, and you know, you could be up in the stands, and even if you don't know much about the game of baseball, can, can you imagine uh, someone beginning to run the base, the base paths in baseball, and then all of a sudden just start running out to right field. Do we know the difference in running the base paths and running to the outfield? Or what if one of those runners on base, what if you all of a sudden you just saw him go from first to third, running right across the diamond? Like he got a base hit and he was trying to get a triple and so he just bypassed second. Everyone knows how ridiculous that would be. I've never seen that, I don't suppose. Can't we know in Christ whether we're walking in the light or in darkness? Meaning, we're going to mess up, we're going to make some mistakes, but are we genuinely trying to walk in the light or are we meandering about and walking in and not really caring about our spiritual lives and walking in darkness? See, if we're walking in the light, we have the victory. 
The victory is ours. And there is a sense in which we have that eternal life. I've written these things. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life? And we have it, and one day it's going to be perfectly realized. Can't we know? You know, sometimes I illustrate it this way. We've got a lot of probably husbands and wives in here, sons and daughters, moms and dads. You know, I am far from a perfect husband. I'm far from a perfect dad. I, I've been far from a perfect son for 42 years. Not perfect in any stretch of the imagination. But you know why I believe my mom and dad who are still living would, would, would say to you if they were here? And what my, my wife would say, hopefully. And what I think Bo, Micah, and Shelby would say if asked and they gave a serious response. He's a faithful son. He's a faithful dad. He's a faithful husband. Far from perfect. But I'm trying to walk in the light, not wondering about... Listen, for the Christian, sin is a, a mistake that we, the, that we make that we're sorry for. But for the one walking in darkness, it is just this habit that has become habitual and almost second nature that we just continue to wander about in. And apparently we don't care enough about spiritual things to make the effort to walk in the light that Jesus, the path that Jesus has paved for us. I may not get any further tonight than just these two points. I don't know. Because I want to get to, to something else to, to help us understand this victory. The victory that's in Christ Jesus. That is defeating to the, to, to the, to the chain of death and the chain of doubt. In 1996, the U.S. women's Olympic softball team, they had, from what I understand, won 115 or 16 games of their last 116 or 17. I'm going to have lost like once in the last 10 years. And they were playing Australia in the U.S. Uh, in the Olympics that were taking place in Atlanta, Georgia. Not too far from here. You remember those Olympics? Some of you say, no, I wasn't born then. So, but I, I was living up in Alaska that summer and I, I'll never forget seeing some of this game and there, there was a the game was tied 0-0 zero to zero. in the fifth inning. The third baseman for the women's team got up to bat, and she hit a home run. Now listen, hitting home runs, unless you're just some amazing player, I, where I grew up, those were kind of few and far between. I mean, I played baseball from the time I think I was in third grade to twelfth grade, and I hit one when I was 12 and three when I was 18, and that was it. And there weren't a whole lot of just huge home run hitters where I was. I mean, hitting a, let's say, a 100-mile-an-hour fastball is not easy. Hitting a, a pitch that is, is 80 miles an hour after you see a 100-mile-an-hour fastball and you have this change, I mean, hitting a baseball is one of the more difficult things to do in sports. Now, this woman hit a home run. They should have been up 1-0. to zero. I mean, everyone already thought they were up 1-0. to zero. But do you remember? Did you ever hear what happened? She touched first, she touched second, she touched third. But she failed to touch home plate. And they called her out. I mean, she was already, already celebrating with her teammates and she missed it. And she's heading back to the dugout. And the Australians appealed and they called her out. The home run was hit. I mean, she was running the base paths correctly or path correctly but she didn't finish the race the US wound up losing in extra innings 2 to 1 in extra innings meaning if she had just completed that path not perfectly i mean she may have rounded this base a little bit too far this way not not illegally but i'm saying hey you know there there may be a precise way the best way to run it but sometimes maybe our path looks a little bit like this, but I mean, we're, we're walking in the light. We're, we're, we might be struggling, but, we're, but we can't forget to touch first, second, third, and finish the race. We've got to finish the course. Now, are we walking in the light? Now, please know, I believe that, that Satan 
I, I, I'm fully aware that he, he's a deceiver. He is a liar and the father of them. And Satan would like nothing more than for lost people to feel saved and saved people to feel lost. And when saved people feel lost, I mean, we're not getting out of the Christian life what God has laid down before us and what He wants us to have. That eternal life where we know it, we believe it, we're walking in it. We're rejoicing in it. We love it. It is the best life. It is that Apostle Paul life. As he imitated Christ, he says, imitate me. But also, what else Satan loves is for people who are actually lost to feel saved. You know, isn't it interesting that when you ask people in the world today, it seems like, this is bizarre, it seems like there's a greater percentage of people in the world who say they're saved than a percentage in the church who say they're saved. Maybe that's not that way everywhere, but in some places it seems to be. You think Satan's done a bang-up job deceiving people, the wiles, the tricks, the snares of the devil? But victory is awesome. And victory is there for anyone. You see, anyone who will humble himself or herself, who will humble themselves, who lets God direct their lives through His inspired Word, which is the map, tells us the way. We're lost, but you know what? Here's the way out of being lost. The Gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God to salvation, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. To God be the glory for that. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah for that. That is awesome. The victory that Jesus gave. It's as if Jesus hit. It's as if Satan's throwing not 100 mile an hour fastballs, but 100,000 mile an hour fastballs. And we have no hope of hitting that. And it's as if Jesus says, listen, Eric, I know that the, the victory's not won yet, but I'm going to step up here to the plate. Satan's throwing these 100,000 mile an hour fastballs, but don't worry, I'm all powerful. I'm omnipotent. And I will give every bit of energy, every bit of life I have to just to, to hit a home run off Satan here. Now, Eric, here's, here's what you do. This is the victory I'm giving you. I just hit the home run. I need you to go run the bases. Well, how do I do that, Lord? Do I run the second first or first first? Do I go to third or home? or How do I do this? Well, just follow me. I'll run on the outside, if you will. I'll show you the way. And then I'll tell you what the way is. He came to earth and He showed us the way. And then His Spirit inspired, gave the apostles and New Testament prophets everything that they needed to write down for us to know so that we could have the victory in Jesus Christ. There's, brothers and sisters, there is absolutely no reason for every single person in this building tonight to not walk out of here saved. Because if we're saved, then that's awesome. Praise God for that. And if we're not, and we're, we're children of God, but we realize we started walking in darkness and we've never gotten out of it, then make a change tonight. Repent of those sins. Perhaps it needs to be done publicly. Perhaps there are some things privately going on in your life and, and, and you're going to take care of those between you and God and that's going to be done privately. Sometimes it's... Good if those things, if they're, they're public sins, for those things to be done, confessed in a public matter, the, the man of the church can pray for you and with you. Maybe you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're walking in darkness. If you are of an age and a mental maturity where you understand sin, the consequences of sin, the recipe for victory in Jesus, then won't you obey the gospel tonight? Confessing faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is the victory in Jesus Christ. Turning away from sin, being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, if, if anyone has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and is not saved, that's quite foolish. It's quite foolish. It is as bizarre as my buddy Kyle Butt lying on his back in the ocean, waiting for someone to save him, 
and him seeing this boat pass by and saying, ah, listen, I got this. I'm all right. You think that was his response? We would all look at that and say, that's ridiculous. Get in the boat. Isn't it interesting how easily we can see these things physically speaking? But spiritually, may God prick our hearts. If you need to respond to God's invitation tonight, won't you do so as we stand and as we sing?